Lost? By the K underscore D. Charlie pulled his damp, thin hands down his face and across an obviously crooked nose, washing away the sweat from the morning sun-drenched walk to the bar. He looked into the mirror, tracing wrinkles that extended themselves from the corners of his blue eyes, making their way to his black and gray-speckled beard. He made sure that the long, black hair remaining on his head was slick back as always. The dial squeaked as he shut off the hot water. As he turned to exit out of the bathroom door that hardly closed, he stopped to take a last look around to make sure everything was in relative order. What you expect from a bar on Decatur Street, though? Stepping out from the sticker and graffiti-covered walls of the bathroom and into the bar's only hallway, he quickly glanced to his left, taking in the view of the centuries-old courtyard. It looked like a scene set for a proper tea party, perfectly lit by the clear day sun. A private utopia ready to be ruined by any customer drunk enough to stumble past the signature stench emanating from just inside the bathroom door and through the residence only sign. The French Quarter is full of buildings with these types of courtyards, but hardly any regular folks get to see them. Turning to his right, Charlie could see the familiar heavyset man at the far bar stool, slumped over his half full beer. It was 10 a.m. and the bar had just opened but Nathan was one of those customers you let in before you officially unlocked the door. Standing next to him was Danny, the new guy. Deborah, the owner, had been letting Charlie hire help whenever he needed it for as long as anyone knew. Charlie had worked for the Gastiniaks family for the last 36 years, rarely missing a day of mopping and restocking duty, maintaining this dingy, physical version of purgatory. He held close the idea that even the most wandering of souls needs a home, at least for a little while. Most new hires only lasted a couple of days since they couldn't stand the smell of fresh puke mixed with stale beer for long anyway. Behind them, the city's seemingly sole remaining CD jukebox hummed along with the morning traffic to the tune of No Fun by the Stooges. No fun, my babe. No fun. No fun to hang around. Feeling that same old way. No fun to hang around. Freaked out. For another day. The floor stuck to Charlie's black combat boots like millions of spectral hands along the well-worn saws, pulling him closer to the concrete as he made his way towards the front of the bar. The morning sunlight was shining through the plastic slats that become the door of the missing mile during open hours. The humidity always creeps through, leaving its sweaty stain on the heavy plastic. Usually, the rain respects boundaries and remains outside the makeshift entrance. You really only have to worry about when it floods. And even then, everyone just pulls their feet up onto the next rung of their stool. This city breeds a special kind of people, resilient to most everything but themselves. Charlie stepped behind the scarred wooden bar and began his work refilling the beer coolers. Morning, Nathan, said Charlie, looking up periodically. Called out again, huh? The most loyal of all regulars had a bad habit of calling out of work. And a bad habit of drinking himself into the early morning hours. The two habits were good friends. Yeah, told him I had a doctor's appointment again, Nathan replied while staring blankly into his beer. I wonder if they're worried about how many times I've been to the doctor lately. Nathan is a hard worker and is paid well for it when he works. But, for the last five years, he had spent more time on his barstool at the missing mile than he did anywhere else. Charlie had become the only friend he had, or wanted. Sure, Eli... The head bartender was his main source of booze, but Charlie was the one who really took care of him and the bar. The customers all liked Charlie. He was one of them, a servant to the human spirit. At the missing mile, the running joke had long been that O.L. Charlie's bones are buried beneath the bar. Most of the mile's regulars wouldn't doubt the joke was rooted in some sort of truth. It's New Orleans, after all. The jukebox clicked, turned over a new CD, and began to rumble with the voice of Johnny Cash. I hear the train a coming, it's rolling round the bend. And I ain't seen the sunshine since I don't know when. 
I'm stuck at Folsom Prison and time keeps dragging on. But that train keeps it rolling. On down to San Antonio. Danny, shouted Eli, from the stockroom. The stockroom being the tiny closet across from the bathroom stuffed full with liquor bottles. The disheveled dark-haired young man, clad in his dirty and faded black overalls, hurried over. His steel-toed boots made that thick thick sound across the floor as he did. It was his first official day on the job, but he had been a customer of the miles for months now. Danny was homeless in New Orleans. That usually meant that for every five dollars handed to him, he could spend four dollars and get a beer and a shot at the missing mile. Charlie often asked Danny why he didn't get food with the dollar he always tipped. Food? You can find free food in any of the endless trash cans that litter the French Quarter. What really nourished Danny was being able to escape, not being stuck in one place, whether it be his own reality or whatever town he happened to land in that week. Cheap whiskey and heroin were the best forms of escape in this city. That's why these young, modern-day hobos tend to get stuck in New Orleans for months at a time. That's also why Charlie likes to get to know the stuck ones, maybe even get them some temporary work, like he's done for years. Take these up to Charlie, then come back and grab a couple bottles of beam, Eli said as he heaved over three cases of beer bottles to Danny. This was Danny's morning, running supplies up to the bar as Charlie put everything in its place. The kid was feeling good about putting in a day's work, especially with people he liked. People that actually saw him. With the wet heat of the afternoon came the usual customers, bartenders getting off the early shifts, the local punks who didn't have anywhere else to go, and tourists carrying their French quarter maps wanting to pretend to be a local for an hour or two. Danny helped Eli serve them all, and no one pretended like they couldn't see him. In the dimly lit, cave-like bar, he felt at home for the first time in years. Moonlight had made its way into the city, changing the glow of the plastic doorway from a glaring yellow to a cool, transparent blue. The air had fallen into a damp warmness as the time neared nine o'clock. Nathan, who was well on his way to calling out of work again, still hadn't given up his seat. From near the door, Kurt Cobain's voice was belting out from the jukebox. People cry and people moan. Look for a dry place to call their home. Try to find some place to rest their bones. While the angels and the devils try to make them their own. Danny approached Charlie at the cash register, nervously looking at the clock on his cell phone. Nine. Shit. I gotta hurry. Do you think I could get paid out a little tonight? Maybe like 40 bucks? Gotta get some food and I'm broke. Charlie nodded without looking towards Danny's way. I figured I would pay you nightly. That way you're always ready to not come back. He looked up from the register and made eye contact with Danny. The kid froze, thinking he had made a horrible mistake. After just enough time to make the situation uncomfortable, Charlie let out a staggered laugh. Danny should have felt instant relief. Instead, staring into Charlie's contorting lips, the young man felt the heaviness of shame weigh on him like a wet blanket. Fuck. He laughs just like my grandpa. The cash register drawer slammed shut and Charlie made his way behind the bar. The plastic doorway slapped against itself as Danny made his quick exit, five $20 bills shoved deep into his right pocket. Charlie stopped at the far end, taking inventory of bottles on his side and faces on the other side of the bar. Used coasters filled the small trash can at his feet. A small pile of shot glasses in need of washing had collected in the sink in front of him. Nathan was deeply engaged in debate over drunken nonsense. You still here, man? I figured you would have been ready to go home by now. Nathan jerked around to see who had interrupted him. I am home, motherfucker. No, I'm having fun. It's not even that late. I can still get a few hours of sleep before morning. Charlie knew what that meant. He had heard the same line for five years now. Nathan seemed to never want to go home. 
Those that frequented the missing mile knew only that their favorite bar friend lived uptown, where the houses cost way more than any of the other regulars could afford. I don't want to go back to all of that filth. Beer and wine bottles everywhere. The hot water hasn't even been on for months. Nathan gave Charlie the slanted smile and spun back around into the conversation that had barely noticed he was absent. The muffled roar that was the group of regulars became the usual background noise for Charlie as he turned to check the bar block. It was nearing 10 o'clock. He had to start getting the place ready for the late night crew. The morning sounds of garbage trucks collecting the previous night's trash of fried chicken bones and neon colored to-go cups roared in the streets of the French Quarter. Green storm shutters smacked together as Charlie pulled them back from the locked entrance of the missing mile. He kicked a drained and dirty to-go cup out of the doorway. God, I hate those hand grenade drinks, pure fucking sugar. Neon green plastic bodies suck dry all night and then we get to deal with the discarded carcasses in the morning. The early warm sunlight spread across his back, illuminating the black and white spiral design painted in the center of his leather jacket. He had worn that jacket every day for what seemed an eternity. Charlie's dry and cracked hand felt cold against the vintage, brass door handle as he pushed the heavy wood open. The plastic strips that replaced the door grasped at him as he made his way into the dark bar, tossing expensive square-lensed sunglasses onto the nearest table. Thank God for the lost and found. Charlie went about his normal morning routine. He restocked bottles onto half-empty shelves behind the bar, checked that the bathroom was stocked up on shit paper and free of cocaine dust and used needles, then briefly searched the rest of the bar for left-behind bodily fluids. You can never underestimate the filthiness of humans, especially in their own home. No Danny, asked Eli. Somehow, he had not alerted Charlie when he walked through the plastic door. It must have been the psychedelic-fueled screams of Jim Morrison coming from the jukebox that aided in his cover. Nope. Maybe one of us will run into him later, maybe not. Charlie replied, now wiping down the bar, preparing it for Eli's takeover. The day passed without much difference from the last. Morning bartenders now became early afternoon whiskey-guzzling bar customers. Thirty-year-old punks were still paying the jukebox to play the same songs as yesterday, and tourists with their maps were pretending they knew how to pronounce Chapatulas. It's Chapatulas, by the way. Familiar conversation begot familiar response, occupying time as it always does. Night fell like dollar bills into the glass tip jar. The seat at the end of the bar was filled by its rightful occupant until closing time. Time marched on outside the plastic door to the missing mile, but those inside hardly ever seemed to notice. Nathan stumbled his way through the plastic slats, the cool night air splashing against his face, sending a quick shiver down his back. A glimpse of the levees breaking raced through his memory again. That was 2005. He's dead. The storm took him and he's not coming back. Get over it already. The broken and uneven bricks that serve as the city's sidewalks were making his normally perilous and drunken journey home even harder than usual. Nathan took an unplanned and unsteady right turn onto St. Anne, which leads directly to Bourbon Street. The bright, neon lights and sounds of 80s cover bands were just a couple blocks away but still further than he usually ventured. Squinting his eyes, blaming the addition of faint neon to his vision, Nathan made out the unmistakable black and white spiral design that let him know it had to be Charlie. The jacket appeared to drape down the back of its rightful owner's thin frame, with two black-clad sticks for legs propping it up. Standing next to Charlie was the missing new guy, Danny, looking the same as he had the day before in faded black overalls and unruly, dark chin-length hair. The younger of the two seemed confused, like he was lost on a street that he had spent incalculable nights occupying. Nathan attempted to approach the duo, but they began walking through the crowds of Bourbon Street and towards the edge of the French Quarter. Any attempt to make his way across that river of sin would be too much to overcome. On top of it all, the whiskey-soaked haze surrounding his head was no match for the buzz of the night. 
Nathan turned and pushed his way through the steady stream of people towards Canal Street. It was time to pour himself into the closest taxi. The morning sun had made the missing Miles Green storm shutters hot to the touch. Charlie leaned into them briefly as he pushed the weathered wood aside. With a swift motion, the door creaked open and the daily replacement of plastic slats fell down into its place. Making his way towards the back of the bar, he stopped mid-step at the sound of quick footsteps approaching the bar. Hands pushed through the plastic doorway, piercing the silence with the sounds of the hanging strips slapping together. It was Eli, just late enough to not have to open, as usual. He greeted Charlie with a pat on the back while making thick thick sounds across the bar floor. Two shot glasses slammed onto the bar top the loud disruption to his routine causing Charlie to spin around. Bullshit. It's just bullshit, man. Eli grunted, obviously annoyed. Charlie replied with a look of concern, quietly instructing the bartender to continue. It's always so uncomfortable when they find out. Eli looked at his cell phone, and then back at Charlie, who was now leaning against a bar stool directly across the wooden barrier. Danny died. Overdose. After he left here, he went right to his dealer. Eli shook his head as he spoke. Some friends found him in the morning. No wonder he didn't show up for work. Shit. I figured he just left town. Charlie nodded along with Eli's news. He did. He was ready to leave. Don't feel bad or responsible. None of us are equipped to fight someone else's demons. Charlie replied calmly. Hell, some people call us demons. Both men turned towards the doorway as it suddenly rustled. Charlie glanced towards the clock, eleven in the morning. He's late. Through the dangling and outstretched plastic arms came Nathan, not removing the dark sunglasses from his distressed face until feeling the absolute security of his seat. Something was different with Nathan, and Charlie could tell. Old ghosts or new ones, this time. I heard about Danny, said Nathan, nodding towards the chilled glass in Eli's hand. It just doesn't make any sense. He just started here, and he seemed happy. Eli slid the sweating beer glass across the bar to their anxious friend, leaving a circular wet trail between the two. I know man. This is why I don't normally get to know those people. We all know how they're going to go out. It's just sad. Eli said, grimacing at the fact that he had let himself get attached to Danny over the last months. He was a good kid. I hope he found peace, or whatever it was he was looking for. Yeah, replied Nathan softly, while sliding his gaze over to Charlie. I thought I'd see him again. I did. I know I did. I was drunk, but not any more than usual. The jarring realization that other customers had begun to fill the bar interrupted the nervous silence surrounding Nathan. It was another early afternoon and the jukebox was flooding the bar with sludgy, heavy metal. Acid baths are favorites among the local degenerates, brutal enough on the senses to keep tourists from staying too long, but not enough to blow out the jukebox's old speakers from repetitive play. There's blood on the moon and the summer is cold. There's love in the room, but baby that's getting old. There's blood on my face, sitting on a dead shore. A highway of emptiness and I'm getting bored. Nathan drank away the day as usual, making sure to not alarm Charlie of his suspicions. Nothing came between him and his booze, not even possibly seeing the dead. Besides, he had to feel somewhat normal if he was going to find out anything more about what he saw last night. He had to know what happened to Danny, what happened after he crossed Bourbon Street with Charlie. The darkness of night came as a relief for the first time in a while for Charlie. He typically enjoyed the long days spent inside the missing mile, tending to others while the world continued to spin outside. After setting up for the late night crew, Charlie grabbed his leather jacket from behind the bar, swung it over one pointy shoulder, and made his way towards the doorway. With his eyes resting downward, the sounds of thick thick echoed in his head as he pulled his boots across the battered concrete floor. 
A cold hand suddenly gripped Charlie's left wrist, just as he neared the plastic entryway. Nathan stared locked with his own searching eyes. It wasn't the first time someone had looked at Charlie that way. It was a familiar stare, but not a shocking one. There wasn't anything that humans could do to shock him after so long, really. Where did you take him? Nathan asked longingly. I saw Danny and you on Bourbon last night. He was fine. Charlie smiled, half-cracked, the same way he did with Danny. I took him home. He was ready. Nathan kept his stare locked onto Charlie, but softened his grip. Charlie shook his hand from side to side as he pulled it closer to his body, away from his curious friend. It had been five years since the two had first met, and Nathan had never once looked Charlie in the eyes. He now saw the aged blue eyes, the wrinkles that forked towards his black and gray beard. The comfort was nearly overwhelming. Nathan asked himself how he had gone so long without looking at anyone this way. Ever since you looked at Richard for the last time. Fuck, I miss him. Long before he had found the missing Mile and Charlie. Breaking his stare, Nathan looked timidly down at this watch. It was nearing 11 o'clock. The night was in its early stages, but the day was almost over. He swung his vision back up to Charlie, the thin man's eyes startling his inner turmoil. Can I walk with you? asked Nathan. I need to get out of here. Charlie pushed his arms into the jacket that had still been draped over his shoulder. The black and white spiral hung from his shoulders, dancing subtly over his narrow back as he moved. He nodded towards the door and the two gingerly made their way outside. The wet heat of the day had become a comfortable warmth, aided by a slight, muddy breeze from the nearby Mississippi River. Danny was ready to go, had been for months. He wasn't one of the surprised ones. The poison we fed him at the mile wasn't working fast enough. Charlie came to a brief pause in his sidewalk stroll, looking directly into Nathan's eyes once again. It'll turn your internal organs into black and goo, sure, but that takes too long for some people. Nathan nodded slowly. Maybe I should have actually gone to all of those doctor appointments. Had him check my belly for black goo. I'm so tired of it. I've been tired of it. They continued walking amongst the tourists that sprawled from Chartres to Royal Street. None of these tourists can afford anything from these antique stores or art galleries. I don't know why they even pretend to shop here. Nathan's words bit at the crowd. Everyone knows they just come to drink too much expensive booze from cheap neon cups and expect all the locals to act like it's Mardi Gras every goddamn day. Charlie laughed heartily at Nathan's sharp words. It's true. They brush fingertips with the other side, in death's very own city, and still ask how much the tour costs. A heavy cloud of neon lightened the night sky as the two approached Bourbon Street. The rapid beat of a street drummer playing for tips nearby fused with the sounds of one of the many indistinguishable cover bands leaking out of a bar on the corner. The sea of people that was Bourbon Street flowed back and forth in front of them, as if in its perfect natural state. Nothing was disturbed by their presence as they stood in the middle of the street, waiting for the perfect tide to set sail. Nathan turned calmly to his left and placed an extended hand on Charlie's leather-covered shoulder. I'm ready, I've been ready, he said soberly. Pushing through the crowd, there was no resistance. The sea looked whitish-gray, with lines of neon orange and yellow dancing behind the waves. Voices and shouts had turned to a muffled ringing, faces blurred as if the moments were lasting an infinity. Suddenly, it was as if he was shoving his way through the heaviest set of clean sheets his mother had ever hung to dry in his childhood home's backyard. Nathan emerged and scathed, expecting to be at least out of breath, on the other side of the Bourbon Street crowd. He looked back, searching for any trace that someone in the sea of people had seen what happened to him. There was nothing, except Charlie, with that half-cracked, knowing smile. Charlie spoke nonchalantly as the two began to walk in step, away from Bourbon Street and the French Quarter, towards the dim street lights of the Sixth Ward. I'm a ferryman, Nathan. 
I know you've heard of us before. Everyone's heard the story about the coins and the eyes, the creepy boat and all that shit. The only difference between the story and us is that we're in every city all over the world. There's too many of y'all for just one of us anymore. Humans always need help. They think they're superior to everything. Praying to their made-up gods, demanding the world be changed to fit their wants. But nature, nature always wins. And nature is forever, just like me. Charlie shook his head, laughing softly under his words. People in this city know about the power of nature. Sure, there's always the ones who fight it, but they either come around or stay wandering forever. It's their choice. Shit. I'm lucky in a way. I don't have to make any of those choices. I just am. Nathan shakily interrupted him. What about me? Am I dead? Not yet. But, I will say, you have good timing. Charlie stopped and stuck a bony finger into the heavyset man's gut. You're full of that black goo. I'm surprised it isn't oozing out of your round, red nose by this point. They finished the walk to Charlie's house without saying a word. It was a large, dark abandoned house with poorly boarded up windows on the edge of the sixth ward. Nathan began to fully embrace what was happening. He felt strangely at home here, far away from the dueling Spanish and French mansions of his previous neighborhood. He placed his boot softly onto the first wooden step, not knowing what to expect. The stairs let out a loud creak as he balanced himself, pretending to decide on whether to take the next step or not. Charlie's keys jangled as he placed them in the old lock, turning the metal handle hard and shoving the heavy door open. The smell of stale cigarette smoke accompanied by the sound of distant voices rushed out of the sudden gap. He looked back at Nathan, who was only halfway up the cracked, wooden steps. The house inside was black behind Charlie, who was framed by the chipped, white paint of the doorway. Nodding towards the house, he turned back and stepped inside. Nathan crept up the remaining stairs, firmly placing his feet on the front porch for the first time. There were dirt-caked crew of Nick's flyers littering the porch from years of past Mardi Gras. At the end of the dusty front porch was a worn and peeled brown leather love seat that looked like it had managed to survive past its most useful years. As Nathan made his final steps into the house, he glanced upwards. Above the chipped, white door frame, a glossy red sign with thick black cursive writing hung above the entrance. I'll see you all in hell or New Orleans. Stories left unread. Please consider subscribing.